I don't know how many of you realize this, but every episode of The Acolyte cost almost double or even more than double the total budget for Godzilla Minus One. And I think I speak for everyone when I say who authorized that and where exactly is all of that money going? Because I've yet to see a single thing on screen that would justify those numbers. Let's discuss. I watch so you don't have to. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. So after what was obviously a very controversial episode last week, The Acolyte makes its return this week for episode 4, and even more questionable creative decisions were made. Nothing quite as egregious as last week, mind you, so I guess we can consider that a little bit of progress. No wait, it appears that this episode of The Acolyte contains a younger version of a prequel era character that technically shouldn't exist yet. Never change, Disney Lucasfilm. Never change. Why are you the way that you are? But I'm still convinced at this point that The Acolyte's biggest problem is a general lack of understanding of basic storytelling. This episode begins with Osha getting ready to leave the Jedi Temple after she's cleared her name. She is relieved to find out that her sister is still alive, but she wants absolutely no part in going to apprehend her. Something that she backtracks on rather quickly just a few minutes later in the episode. It really gives me the impression that once again the creative team for the Acolyte is displaying a very clear lack of patience. I understand that these are only 30 minutes or so long episodes, but they are the ones who made that decision. Not that I'm asking for more Acolyte or suggesting that more time would have helped, but the story that they are trying to tell does feel very rushed after only four episodes. It feels like things are moving and changing rather quickly. Too quickly, actually. All in an effort to get us to the end game as quickly as possible without actually earning it. And this is no more obvious than with the character of Mei in this episode. Early on, she is reminded that Osha being alive doesn't change anything by discount Ezra Miller. And that she needs to live up to her end of the bargain and finish killing off these Jedi. So now it's heavily being insinuated that May has absolutely no personal stakes in this matter whatsoever. And it does kind of undermine the revenge take aspect of this story. But that shouldn't really surprise anyone because Lucasfilm does have a tendency to get in their own way creatively. I knew it, I'm surrounded by assholes. Next we have Jedi highlighting how May is undisciplined and yet somehow she was able to kill two Jedi Masters. It's almost as if the writers knew that the audience would not buy her character in this situation, and they basically added this line of dialogue to the script to make themselves feel better about it. Leslie Headland's green girlfriend then tells the other Jedi that May was most likely trained by a Jedi, and that they shouldn't tell the Jedi Council because they would be obligated to tell the Senate, and the Jedi really can't afford a scandal right now. Not only did this come off as a not-so-clever way of writing the Jedi Council out of this series, so they don't have to balloon the already ridiculous budget by showing them, but it also made me question, once again, whether or not the writers of this show actually understand Jedi at all. Absolutely f***ing not. It's like they are writing the Jedi to be this morally ambiguous association that refuses to be transparent, and has ulterior motives in place to protect what is perceived to be their false image. And I don't know about anyone else, but I've never looked at the Jedi in this way. Anyway, Saul is adamant that he wants to be the one to bring May in. But the green chick doesn't think it's a good idea because of his much too personal connection to her. I guess we're going to overlook the fact that Soul is probably the only halfway decent Jedi in the entire show. Even if you wanted to use the excuse that Soul is on May's kill list. And it wouldn't make sense to put him in close proximity to her. I might be able to buy that. But saying it's because of personal reasons really doesn't connect for me. Either way, it doesn't really matter because moments later he is recruiting Osha for this mission. And Osha agrees pretty easily after Soul plays the family card. 
My, how the tables have turned. On their way to the forest planet where Mei is supposed to be hunting the Wookiee Jedi, Osha meets a curious looking creature on the ship. And she asks one of the Jedi, is he or they with us? They? Why would she ask if they are with us? To my knowledge, there's only one of these creatures. Oh, wait, I get it. Never mind, let's move on. So the pronoun creature has been trained to track down Mei or the Wookiee Jedi on this forest planet. On this journey, there's a lot of talk about Osha confronting her past and herself by going after Mei. And it's all supposed to be a lot more deep and meaningful than it actually ends up being. Up next, we have the character of Mei getting consistently less interesting the more that she talks. She reveals to discount Ezra Miller that the reason her master told her that she can't kill the Jedi with weapons is because attacking a defenseless person goes against everything that a Jedi stands for. Kind of like this show in general. Suddenly, she's having second thoughts about her mission, and now she's claiming that it's impossible. A weird thing to say when you've already killed two people. She then says that if she doesn't go through with this, that her mysterious master will most likely kill her. She is basically doing all of this against her will. Which again, as I said at the beginning of this video, makes her character considerably less intriguing. And this is where Mei decides to flip the whole narrative of this show on its head. By proclaiming her allegiance to her sister Osha, and saying that she is going to surrender to the Jedi. I mean, just a few moments prior to this, she was still calling her sister Jedi scum. Then again, they have set a precedence for Mei being somewhat impulsive, so maybe this was on purpose. You can't stop me. I'll kill you. Boy. That escalated quickly. Either way, the sudden change of heart is not handled in the most narratively pleasing way. And it did come off as somewhat abrupt and random like most things in this show. Again, lending itself to my theory that the creatives behind this series have no knowledge of how to make a plot unfold gradually and naturally. It's like they're just doing things, logic be damned. So eventually, Mei decides to abandon Discount Ezra, the pronoun creature finds her, and the Jedi close in on her. And she runs into the Jedi Wookiee's house to find him dead already, presumably at the hands of her master. Now, either her master is very intuitive and quick to travel long distances in a short amount of time, or he's been following her the whole time, maybe even hiding in plain sight. It's going to be Discount Ezra Miller, isn't it? This is going to be Dark Flash all over again. Talk to you soon, okay? Bye! As the Jedi and Osha get ready to arrest Mei, we do get one of the coolest shots in this entire series. I know that's a low bar, but it's still worth mentioning. Because we see the villain of this story glide into frame out of focus right behind Osha. And to me, it was done in a way initially that made the character's entrance very impactful. Unfortunately, when he comes into focus, he does look like the Disney Star Wars version of the Pulp Fiction Gimp. Bring out the Gimp. I think the Gimp's sleeping. Well, I guess you just have to go wake him up now, won't you? So he fires up his lightsaber, the Jedi attack, and he force pushes about eight of them away. Now, I don't know if this speaks to the incompetence of the Jedi in this story, or the overwhelming and unfathomable strength of this character, but either way, we are left with a cliffhanger here. And I guess moving forward, the mystery has now shifted to who is under the mask, even though I kind of have an idea who it is. For the first ever Star Wars show to revolve around a mystery, it's not actually very good at delivering those mysteries. Of course she brought up pronouns, leave it to the incels to focus on one line of dialogue and turn it into more than it is. Just admit that you're a bigot and leave it at that. This is easily the best episode of The Acolyte so far, and I personally can't wait to see more. Mwah. Chef's kiss. Really? Pronouns? Now we're talking about pronouns in Star Wars. My pronouns are pretty simple, actually. They are I hate, and everything. Let's see, so far we got fat Jedi, lesbian witches, genderless creatures, so what's next? 
Why don't you just add Gay Greedo to the mix so he can tell us who shot first and get it over with. Just when you think Disney Star Wars can't get any worse, they hire an activist to double down on their pandering and propaganda. Y'all be cool. Right on.